Hello and welcome to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. It is brought to you by both the Brattleboro Retreat and Brattleboro Community Television. We have today a discussion about this celebrating 20 years of Starting Now. Starting Now is a intensive outpatient and outpatient addiction treatment service that the Brattleboro Retreat has offered now for 20 years. And it provides help with addiction recovery over the long haul for people who are have been affected by the great suffering of addiction both those both the addict and family members and help from people who really understand that it, addiction causes great suffering today i have with me kurt white who is uh, our clinical manager of starting now and the birches and he is a social worker and drug and alcohol counselor at the retreat he started at the retreat in 2005 in the co-occurring disorders unit and also with me today is Dr. Jeffrey Kane who is uh, the chief of addiction services at the Brattleboro Retreat. He has been the chief of addiction services since 2003. He's been in the addiction field since 1974. He also has a master's of public health and he's the author of a column called Addiction Medicine Updates for the National Council of Addiction and Drug Dependence. So starting now 20 years. Um, there are some things we wanted to cover today to just get a sense of what um, what you have experienced in the addiction field. You have both not been at 20 at, at starting now for 20 years, but you certainly have been around addiction treatment for that amount of time. And one of the things that we really wanted to cover today had to do with treatment, medication, levels of care, and style of care. And I just want to start off with you telling us a little bit about your own personal experience with treatment and what you've seen, how you've seen treatments uh, change in the last 20 years. And we'll start with you, Dr. Kane. Um, as you said, Gay, I've been around the addiction treatment field for a long time, and there are some very dramatic changes in the last 20 years. Uh, though, turning back to uh, the late 1900s, uh, that was a time when uh, what people have come to call the Minnesota model was uh, kind of gaining sway in treatment circles. And back in the mid 20th century in Minnesota, a number of sort of factors came together in treatment programs, uh, Pioneer House, Hazelden, uh, Wilmar State Hospital, where people brought together the latest science with personal experience, sort of medicine meets AA. And it became uh, 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 the dominant approach to treatment through the, to the end of the uh, 20th century. And more science has come in, more techniques have come in, but when starting now began 20 years ago, it was a continuation of that approach to treatment with uh, uh, a blending of sort of medicine and, and science about addiction and recovery, and also uh, drawing on the wealth of practical wisdom and personal experience that had been growing since the 1930s. And would, what do you see um, in retrospect in your time? What have you seen and how have you seen treatment change since practice, since, since beginning your practice? Yeah, well, I've been in practice a bit less long than <laughs> Dr. Kane has, uh, 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 but uh, uh, at the retreat for a, a similar amount of time. Uh, even in that period of time, uh, one of the most noticeable changes in the uh, addiction treatment world is more um, is a greater prevalence of, of uh, medications to treat addictive illness, uh, greater use of existing medications, uh, new uses for some medicines that were on the market but weren't being used for some things, and new formulations of them, uh, and uh, um, and actually medicine, new medicines that have been developed and released onto the market uh, in that period of time. Uh, for, for treating addiction, also for treating psychiatric illness. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we 
uh, didn't have the antidepressant medications and the uh, antipsychotic medications that are sometimes used for sleep, sleep and anxiety and other things. So there's been a remarkable uh, 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 development of medication, psychopharmacology, but also brain research. And mm -hmm. we know a lot, lot more now about what's going on in the brains of people with addictive illness than we did 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, um, someone would show up for treatment and what would be the protocol at that time? What, what were the um, steps that someone would take at that point that are different from what would happen today? And we might put the Starting Now program in perspective. Uh, it's an intensive outpatient program where uh, the uh, treatment personnel are predominantly counselors and it's largely group-based, so there's group counseling and individual mm -hmm. counseling. And, and it goes on for several weeks, I mean, 10 weeks or so. And the people that come in tend to come from two sources. One would be uh, the hospital, people who have had physiologic dependence on an addictive substance, alcohol or, what, or opioids, and they needed a medically managed detox. So they would step down from the hospital into the intensive outpatient program. The other source of patients, though, is the community, people who would uh, uh, learn that they've, or recognize that they've got a problem or perhaps be levered into treatment by family or an employer or the legal system, and they'd come into treatment uh, but without a serious enough level of physical dependence that, that, so they didn't need a detox, but they would come into this structured setting and, and move on uh, there. And, and uh, this would, especially with the duration of treatment, give people a chance to learn to cope with their illness learn what they need to do and not do to remain sober and get networked into uh, other community resources that would sustain them after the end of the program. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and what I've um, learned as I've, I've worked at the retreat, and I've only been there for about four years myself, is that um, there was really a change in how addiction has been looked at. It was, it was looked at more as a and maybe you can speak to this, Kurt. At, at some point, it was sort of looked at as a moral uh, weakness, uh, psychological disorder, and over time, we've learned a lot about it and, and framed it in the, the frame of chronic illness, hmm. much like one would frame diabetes. Or And, and could you speak to that a diabetes, little bit? Diabetes, hypertension, asthma, sure. The, um, um, but, you know, actually the, the idea of addiction as a disease goes back a long way, longer than, most, than many people uh, understand. And it was, in, in fact, the, 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 the dominant way of thinking about addiction in the 19th century. Uh, and it actually kind of fell out of, fell out of fashion in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, when more, um, more of those sort of moralistic views uh, that the problem is not... Uh, the problem is not a, a disease, but is a moral failing of the person uh, that came back into into uh, to hold some sway, uh, and also the idea that the problem wasn't the disease of the person, but was the substance itself. And you see that most notably in the uh, prohibition movement uh, in the early part of the century, mm -hmm. and then the uh, successful prohibition efforts, not just uh, on the federal level, but in many, many uh, states and local governments uh, across the country also. Uh, and then the disease uh, idea had to be sort of almost rediscovered in the 20th century. Uh, some people associate this uh, most with, uh, with Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and they they, uh, that group does definitely have a, uh, a part in it, but uh, I, um, um, there's been a great deal of, of more uh, sort of um, uh, nuanced description of what we mean by disease. When mm -hmm. we say addiction is a disease, what kind of a disease is it? What ca and what does that mean? And why is that important? And, what is it, and why do we talk about that and teach that to patients and patients' family members? Um, why and do you teach it to... Patient, because it gives some members. major clues into the way that you handle that you that to have the best possible success in treating that 
this, this disease, which if left uh, untreated can be uh, progressive and life-threatening, uh, that it gives us the best chance of being able to provide the most effective kinds of treatments, both in the uh, immediate uh, time when people need the most intensive treatments and also over the, over the, long, uh, over the longer course of, uh, of sort of health maintenance and disease management, mm -hmm. right? There's a, a 1990 paper uh, by uh, Thomas McClellan and, and others uh, um, who was at the um, um, Centers for, no, he was at the uh, a government agency, <laughs> um, and uh, who was talking, there was a paper by Tom McClellan and others in, in, the, uh, in a, uh, the year 2000, I think, by uh, talking about uh, drug addiction as a uh, chronic illness, where it compared it to diabetes, hypertension, and asthma uh, in terms of the causes and in terms of the uh, ways that you uh, ways that, that there is a genetic uh, linkage, the uh, uh, physiologic uh, impacts on the body, uh, and then uh, and then how we ought to think differently about treatment as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Now those diseases are are different than diseases like uh, you know influenza, which hopefully you know you get and then you get treated and then you hopefully have have cure. You know no more influenza. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea there is that you you get treatment for it, but there is a uh, perhaps a, a remission of the disease state or something like that or something sort of new and better that we talk about in the addiction world of recovery uh, that um, uh, that we can pursue and help people cultivate over the long longer course of their lives uh, to maintain uh, the kind of, of health that they want to have it becomes more of a more of a long-term process uh, than a, a short-term process you know it's mm -hmm. not come into treatment and have treatment, and at the end of it, you're you're done. Uh, mm -hmm. It's come into treatment, and then you you learn about what it is this illness, uh, this disease means. What does it mean that you have it, and what can we, how can we work with that uh, in order to uh, help that person have the life that they want to have? And oftentimes, the the uh, addiction goes hand in hand with what we call. Uh, I mean, and this is where I can ask you, Dr. Kane, more about the the concept of co-occurring disorder. W when did when did we start using that that term, and what does that mean exactly when you hear that, and when and for instance, when a family member hears that, what does co-occurring disorder mean? I'd like to answer that, but still, I'm still with current history a little bit. Okay. Here. Um, if there are viewers who would like to get who don't have access to Kurt every day and would like to get <laughs> more of a view of, of the history. Mm. Uh, the book by William White, uh, Slaying the Dragon, uh, A History of Addiction Treatment and Recovery in America, mm -hmm. is uh, exhaustive and with a certain amount of color and, and uh, uh, detail, you know, rehearses that whole uh, progression. Uh, and uh, it's, it's widely accessible. Uh, as far as the, the think about addiction as a disease is concerned, uh, uh, diseases are kind of categories that we use in medicine uh, to classify people who have enough problems in common that they respond to similar treatments. So they're, they're convenient and they fit with technology. And with the brain science that I mentioned before, with the, with the medications that Kurt mentioned, um, it's very convenient to think of addictions as diseases. And and it's very helpful to uh, 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 patients affected by them because it gives them a, a, a way of understanding this process that's been taking over their lives and, and provides them with tools for coping, including just simple <coughs> acceptance and, mm -hmm. and naming it. So it, it demystifies it and gives them a handle on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Co-occurring disorders is a term that we use to refer to people who have one or another forms of mental illness in association with addiction. And back uh, 20 more years ago, uh, the approach was cr uh, clumsy at best. Uh, mm -hmm. People thought, well, we'll take care of the addiction and then we'll get around to taking care of the mental illness. So we'll take care of the mental illness and then we'll get around to taking care of the addiction. But when people tried to approach it sequentially, the problem that wasn't being addressed was messing up everything that was being done for the problem they were trying to address. Mm -hmm. and 
and people talked about uh, using terms primary, secondary. Well, this is what's causing the other, and that didn't work very well. And then primary, secondary. Well, this came first, and the other came second, and that didn't work very well. So finally, as sort of a, a, a truce among professionals, people started to talk about co-occurring disorders. They're happening at the same time. We know we need to treat them both. And what the research showed is, yes, that's the way to think about it. And when they're treated together, at the same time with the same treatment staff, um, that's the most effective form of treatment, mm -hmm. which uh, goes back to what you mentioned before about uh, uh, a reference to Tyler One in, in the retreat where Kurt has worked, where I worked with that's Kurt. That's a floor. And, and Tyler works. One but, refers to a floor at the retreat. Yes, yeah. an inpatient treatment unit. We call it the co-occurring disorders unit. Yes. And most people there have addiction. Most people there have uh, a mental illness. And it's sort of a full-service uh, psychiatric unit and a full service addiction treatment unit mm -hmm. with a lot of people being detoxed mm -hmm. and and the the treatment staff are savvy about both areas mm -hmm. um, when i worked at a hospital in new hampshire probably 20 or a little bit more years ago uh, uh, i was on a committee where we were supposed to develop a dual diagnosis program which is the older term for co-occurring disorders and we met and we talked and we met and we talked and we never got anywhere so after a while I said, well, at this hospital we have two dual diagnosis units. We call them adult psychiatry and adult chemical dependency. Mm. There's so much overlap in both places, it didn't seem, it, if we opened a third unit, we would have emptied the other two. <laughs> I remember the, one of our, the counselors who works in Starting Now uh, uh, was telling a story about one of the first jobs that he had where he was the, the first uh, substance abuse clinician hired into a an agency that did mental health counseling and didn't pay very much attention to substance abuse at all. Uh, but some of them began to suspect that maybe some of their clients, maybe maybe some of them had substance use uh, problems uh, that might be making their uh, mental health problems uh, worse. I think that was how it was conceptualized at the time. And so they hired him on, I think, at, at 20 hours a week in a facility that had, you know, 20 or more uh, wow. uh, um, other clinicians. Uh, and he said it took a little while, but people would sort of come and eventually start knocking on his door. Uh, and then it was sort of like they couldn't get enough of it. They couldn't get enough of his time. You know, the more that people uh, would talk with him, him, the more people were were aware that that uh, if you that if you people who were conceptualizing treatment through the mental health lens only were sometimes missing uh, a substance use piece uh, that uh, was impacting those disorders or was even uh, driving those the the mental health symptoms and disorders to some greater or lesser extent. Uh, and so now we really try to be, no matter what door someone first comes into, uh, we try to assess uh, comprehensively uh, substance use and mental health uh, problems as much as we can. Uh, can you give me a chance, because I want to touch on this a little bit, because I think this is important in terms of uh, the layperson understanding this a little bit more, too, is the, the, what has changed in terms of medication. Uh, we spoke about this the other day when we were prepping for this. Um, a lot has changed in the last 20 mm -hmm. years, um, and obviously, um, if, we're, if, if people are looking at mental health issues with addiction issues, then um, there must be a lot of thought put into whether people need to be on medications when they have an addiction problem. What does that mean? Let's set aside the whole issue of psychiatric medication, which some of these people need, mm -hmm. and talk about medications for addiction. Mm -hmm. First alcohol dependence or alcoholism, and then opioid dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 20 years ago, what we had as medicine for alcohol dependence was disulfiram and abuse. Uh, uh, years ago, rubber workers started to get sick and throw up on weekends. And uh, researchers eventually figured out that a chemical used in the processing of rubber, disulfiram, was getting absorbed by them. And uh, it turns out that this, and this chemical blocks the breakdown of alcohol in the liver. So if they then drank, uh, uh, they would all of a sudden get a lot of acetaldehyde, which normally there isn't much of. Mm -hmm. uh, the enzyme that gets rid of it is blocked by disulfiram. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that led to this medication, better known as the end abuse, and people who are alcoholic and they definitely don't want to drink, take this every day knowing that if they were to, in a moment of inattention or uh, 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 whatever, take a drink, it would make them seriously ill. Mm -hmm. And that's been around for decades. In 1994, 
Uh, naltrexone, and I'll mention this again with, with opioid dependence, but naltrexone, which had been around for a while for the treatment of opioid dependence, was approved by the FDA for treatment of alcohol dependence. Uh, it, it blocks the endorphin receptors, the opioid receptors in the brain where morphine would go, heroin would go, uh, and doesn't have any action there, but it affects the reward pathway in the brain. And people on it seem to, if they're alcohol, alcoholic, they seem to crave alcohol less, and if they do, so it helps before the fact of picking up a drink. But after the fact, it helps uh, by you know, removing some of the pleasure or reward of the alcohol so they don't get as high, so they tend to drink less. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, a third medicine, a camprosate, uh, also known as Camprol, has been approved in the United States, I'm going to guess six years. It's been used in Europe a lot longer than that. And uh, we think it works on the glutamate receptor in the brain and seems to make it make people less likely to just pick up a drink on automatic pilot and and uh, and the testimonials from patients support that it's pretty effective the latest research shows that it's not as effective as as naltrexone mm -hmm. as far as opioid dependence is concerned you know 20 or more years ago we did have methadone as a you know groundbreaking drug for stabilizing people with especially you know, heroin addiction in inner cities. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it would stabilize the brain, keep them out of withdrawal, relieve craving. And, and the statistics were great in terms of reduced crime, uh, 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 increased employment, you know, better, more stable families, uh, uh, less infectious disease. And then the HIV ep ep epidemic came along and it seems to reduce uh, new HIV infection as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and is often a lifelong treatment. Uh, uh, relapse rates when people go off methadone maintenance are pretty high. Some people come off for good reasons, some people come off for bad reasons, but still relapse rates are pretty high, like 20%. 20% mm -hmm. success, I should say, 80% relapse rates. Uh, and in 2003, uh, buprenorphine in the form of suboxone, a sublingual preparation that is also an opioid, also goes into the endorphin receptors, uh, was approved for treatment of opioid dependence. And, and or it might have been approved in 2002, but wasn't available till 2003. And that's available by prescription. Doctors in their offices uh, uh, can prescribe it. Uh, Kurt and I are both involved with a large program at the treat with you know, some 130, 150 patients mm. who come on a regular basis for prescriptions, and it it also provides some of the method, the benefits of methadone for stabilization, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's yet it's more convenient for the patient. They don't have to go to the clinic. Every so day. this must represent a, a a remarkable change in what you're you're seeing, um, in terms of outcomes and how people can live their lives. It it, it does. It, it provides a sort of a physiologic platform for people to stand on to pursue recovery. Mm -hmm. One of the downsides is we have trouble convincing people that that's not, an, that that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it provides a platform, but it doesn't build the shelter, which people do in interpersonal right. relationships, uh, in therapy, in mutual help programs like AA. And we try to ensure that people get that message and do that also. So, Kurt, if we were to talk about that in terms of um, uh, levels of care, um, and because I wanted to touch on the levels of care, I wanted to touch on the style of care, the changes that you've you, that you've seen, but also I want I want to also fit in some questions about questions that family members may ask when they have a loved one end up in um, addiction treatment. Um, could you speak about uh, how the retreat, um, for instance, somebody comes into detox, they go to they go to Tyler One, for instance, which is the co-occurring disorders floor. They're in there, they get detoxed. Is the next step that they go to starting now? Is the next step that they go, for instance, to the Birch's, Birch's program, which you're also the clinical manager of? What, what are the steps? Well, it, it would depend a bit on uh, a number of factors. Uh, the, the American Society for Addiction Medicine, or, or ASAM, has a document, the ASAM Patient Placement Criteria second edition revised, uh, that, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, that sort of goes through and sort of helps uh, providers who are working with clients to try to 
to uh, match people to the kind of treatment, the intensity of treatment that, uh, that would best help them for where they are. That is actually one of the shifts over the last a couple of decades, I think, is that the approach to where you put people in treatment, at what level of intensity, be it uh, residential uh, rehab, you know, like a uh, you know, two to four week residential rehab uh, or longer residential treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some uh, longer programs that, that are still out there and, and exist. Uh, and, or uh, something in, like an intensive all day program like partial hospitalization or something like it's starting now, intensive outpatient, which is sort of less than partial hospitalization, but still quite intensive. That you'll come in uh, several times a week for several hours a day. Yeah, and there's both an evening and a both an a evening day and program. a day program to accommodate uh, people's different schedules and, and work lives. Uh, and some people are able to to uh, to, to uh, just uh, uh, come into treatment, uh, perhaps not so much through detox, but uh, to come into treatment and just need treatment at the outpatient individual level of care. Mm -hmm. And there are different factors in terms of how much support does the person have in their outside life and uh, how what other sorts of treatments have been tried successfully or unsuccessfully in the in the past. Uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, um, you know, what's a bunch of different factors uh, all go into that uh, determination. Whereas I think it, it would have been more likely 20 years ago for people to sort of start out in something like a 28-day program mm -hmm. without, uh, without a lot of distinction being made about who needs that or more than that and who needs uh, that or less than that. You know, at the beginning, I mentioned the Minnesota model as where science and experience came together. Uh, the experience dimension also include Includes positive spirituality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, uh, another association with the Minnesota model has been one size fits all treatments. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during the years that I've been in the field, uh, the sort of there was the rise and and decline of of 28 day or 30 day programs. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, 25 years ago, if someone came into a hospital for addiction treatment, they would probably be there for four weeks whether they needed it or not. Mm -hmm. Now with the crisis in healthcare costs and, and the responses to that like managed care and uh, the development of uh, more scientific approaches like the ACM criteria that Kurt mentioned, it's more individually tailored. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we hope people, if they touch the treatments, system like Kurt said before, there's no wrong door, the professionals will kind of organize it and help them get what they need and proceed along a path that's tailored for them. And the, the good news, the really good news is that people, uh, that in Vermont is, and uh, we have uh, um, many, many of the different uh, ASEM dimensions, many of the different levels of care uh, from uh, residential, uh, intensive outpatient, outpatient, uh, and even some uh, longer term uh, residential treatment uh, that's uh, available, uh, paid for through the, uh, through the uh, um, State Department of Health, uh, um, uh, ADAP, the Substance Abuse uh, um, Services branch of the Department of Health, um, and that we can, uh, and that many people can get better at, with uh, less treatment than they used to get necessarily, or less level of intensity, and so it's less interrupting of people's lives. But if more treatment is needed, then it is available, and we can often help move people in that direction. And, and back to the sort of disease concept and the chronic disease concept, um, uh, uh, ideally, uh, people do lots of self care and self management. Uh, if I have high blood pressure, I may take a medicine, but I also need to be careful about diet and exercise and you know, weight and things like that. And a lot of that would be on me as an individual person or patient. And, and what we try to do in the progression through treatment is help people to get better at uh, addressing their own needs and taking care of themselves, learning what they're up against. It's the nature of addiction that they can't trust themselves, they have to keep their distance and not uh, think that they can take just one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they also need to grow as individuals, grow in resilience so they'd be less likely to care about escaping reality. They'll enjoy reality too much. Mm -hmm. And and that's where the interpersonal uh, uh, forms of treatment come in, group, uh, individual therapy. And, the, and sustain relationships with a program. 
And rec well, recovery supports uh, in the community. Yeah, it tends to mm -hmm. shift from program to the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, the main paradigm would be Alcoholics Anonymous, also Narcotics Anonymous, mutual help or self-help programs in the community where people often get very involved and stay involved. Mm -hmm. So. So it's like, I don't know, I, 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 I don't need to see my blood pressure treater very often because I'm in a health club and, and maybe I show up every once in a while. Now, we think it is advisable for people to have, to be accountable to someone for mm -hmm. reco recovery. So some people complete the starting now and they come back to the same, uh, one of the same staff members for a relapse prevention group. And then after a month or three of that, they may still see that counselor you know, a few times a year for you know, encouragement and also accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 12-step recovery, sponsors can provide that, that form of accountability. When someone's on a medication, uh, uh, be it you know, uh, uh, naltrexone or uh, suboxone, there's some built-in accountability because they have to show up to the prescriber and and say what's going on. Do I get a sense when I talk or ask these questions of you, do you feel optimistic about the changes and the direction that drug addiction treatment or addiction treatment is going at this point? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think the more the more good science we have behind it, the more we'll be able to do both with um, uh, talking therapies and interpersonal treatments and also um, um, medication treatments uh, and, uh, and the like uh, on, the, uh, on the medical end. Mm -hmm. and, and science is guiding the interpersonal aspects of treatment. Absolutely. Now, 20 years ago, it was fairly common for counselors to argue Mm -hmm. with patients and in group maybe put them in the hot seat mm -hmm. and and remind them of their mistakes and that proved to make it more likely they'd leave treatment and go back to alcohol or whatever the drug was mm -hmm. uh, so it was toxic to them personally and to their recovery mm -hmm. now uh, there's more empathy and understanding still a reality based you know holding people accountable for what they've done and not done and reminding them of where those behaviors will lead them back if they persist, mm -hmm. but also it, it's more uh, empathic, more understanding, and and there's more communication of hope rather than a reminding reminders of of pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me ask you just a few questions related to perhaps the family members, friends who are watching this program today. Um, suddenly, they have a loved one who enters addiction treatment. Uh, for alcohol, it could be cocaine, it could be crystal meth. Um, what, what, are, what should they be expected um, to understand? Um, what can they hope to understand? And how, do you, how would you help to guide them with first the initial period of time and then also that long haul? Um. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect family members to initially to understand uh, anything at all uh, about uh, about addiction or uh, or uh, or what treatment is going to involve. And so, there's a lot that we have to do as providers to uh, educate and help people understand uh, what what that's about. What is the what is the person in treatment doing in treatment? Uh, what are they? Uh, what were they? Uh, and to speak with them about what was going on at home uh, for them. And and also uh, for the for, for the both for the uh, person seeking treatment and also for the uh, for the loved one, uh, and I would want to encourage people, uh, family members, to uh, also uh, remember that they need that you need care also uh, that uh, that addiction is an illness that affects the entire family uh, and that uh, it's very important for everybody involved to get uh, a significant amount of of uh, support as a result of that uh, uh, there are organizations uh, like uh, AA and NA for for the addicted person and, and then for the uh, uh, family member support of others there are uh, 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 Al-Anon and uh, Naranon for uh, for uh, the uh, family members uh, working uh, 
uh, with the uh, person who, in, uh, who has a, with family members of a person with an addictive illness. Uh, and so I would want to introduce them to what the treatment process is going to be like for the person, introduce them to addiction and what it is, including the idea of it being a, uh, an illness, a disease, and a, and a chronic disease that needs uh, both acute and longer term attention, and to uh, ways that both the loved one and the family will likely need support in the immediate sense and also over the the long term. Mm. And Dr. Kane, I wonder mm. what you would say about, to a family member, for instance, about uh, measuring success. How does a family member kind of have a sense that things are going well or not going well? Or uh, um, that's, a, that's a pretty hard thing to measure. Maybe they shouldn't even be thinking about that. They should be thinking about themselves. Um, if, if it's, well, if it's addiction, is there drug use or not? Is there, you know, is the drinking continuing or the drug use continuing, and the the behaviors that go along with that? Um, I think it becomes difficult for family members when a family member has established recovery and then gone back, mm -hmm. and and uh, and I've I sat with a spouse once who was deciding to end the marriage after you know, so many relapses because the spouse just wasn't prepared to watch the progression. The love was there, but, but it, it was too hard to watch and be close to. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people and families have to decide what their sort of tolerance might be. I had many conversations with parents saying, uh, uh, you're in a tough spot. I don't have the crystal ball or the wisdom to know what to do, but but acknowledging that on the one hand, if they're too harsh, you know, if they're too tough with tough love, and say, okay, you're you're out of here. I mean, that could could possibly lead to you know the death of their child with mm -hmm. due to addiction. On the other hand, if they're too forgiving and and don't hold them accountable to their behavior and what they're doing and not doing then they make it too easy to stay addic addicted mm -hmm. and and that could cost them their child as well mm -hmm. and and the middle ground is uh, is setting some limits and holding the person accountable to meeting them and then following through with it with whatever the you know stated or agreed upon consequences would be mm -hmm. um, the uh, you mentioned the addiction medicine update column and at www.ncadd.org, uh, there's uh, uh, about 10 of these columns now, and one in the spring was on intervening on alcohol style matters. Mm -hmm. and, and the style that's effective is, is firm and also loving. And uh, uh, a woman modeled that uh, uh, for one of our treatment teams and for myself, her husband was alcoholic, professional guy, but uh, stayed drinking, and and you know she said, you know, I I, I love you, I uh, admire you, I admire your work, and this drinking is messing up my life so much that I will not stay in this marriage. I want you back, but there's no room for alcohol, mm -hmm. and and she put conditions on. Uh, his completing treatment with us, he thought he was ready to go, and also put a condition on uh, that he go away to a three-month program mm -hmm. uh, geared toward helping uh, uh, professionals get a better handle on things. Speaking of your column, you just wrote a column about the holidays, and the holidays are a really tough time for families, uh, whether the, the, um, the addict or alcoholic is drinking or not. It can be a tough time. Do you have any sage advice, um, both of you, sage advice for people who are, you know, Thanksgiving's a couple weeks away, there's a lot of drinking and uh, there's a lot of um, imbibing in um, various, uh, even food. This can be <laughs> can be an issue, but um, what would you tell people about thinking or planning for the holidays? I, I would tell them be careful. 
Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's the that's the sort of central message. It's a time, uh, among other things, of a lot of uh, social and cultural uh, permission giving around drinking alcohol. Uh, a disproportionate amount of the the all of the alcohol that's consumed the entire year is consumed in the in the forty or so days between Chris, uh, Thanksgiving and New Year's. Uh, and uh, and so this is a this is a time when people are are likely to to feel an external as well as an internal uh, pressure to use. And for those that have uh, an addictive illness, that's going to be uh, all the all the all the more greater, exponentially greater, uh, especially if that person is in uh, an earlier uh, sort of recovery. Uh, and so to uh, to be careful and to uh, to take precautions about it, uh, knowing that that's probably going to be a difficult period. And you might say more about that since well, uh, echoing, be careful, uh, yeah. precautions. Going to a social gathering, yep. well, stay away from social gatherings where you know maybe uh, uh, getting intoxicated or high is expected behavior. Uh, there are uh, social gatherings over the holidays that are substance-free, you know, alcathons, for example, that mm -hmm. exist in this community at holiday time. Uh, going to a social gathering, bring bring your own beverage. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that might be non-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're hosting a party, make sure there are plenty of non-alcoholic selections, juices, seltzer, uh, fruit, lemons, limes. Uh, and if, if somebody puts out you know, punch or eggnog, make sure it's labeled with very sturdy labels that mm -hmm. it's alcohol-free or contains alcohol. And maybe it's even okay to have parties where there's no alcohol. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, especially if you're underage. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Many people don't miss it at all, uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's sometimes uh, um, if a person has been particularly used to holidays that have involved a lot of uh, of uh, substance use, it can be uh, hard to imagine that that's true. Uh, but it really is true that there's despite the increase in consumption uh, at this time of year, there are still a lot lot of people uh, who don't use at all uh, or who use uh, very little and attend quite a lot of uh, substance-free gatherings and so to seek those out and uh, uh, and uh, develop them yourselves if you if you aren't able to seek them out mm -hmm. I should put in a little plug for the uh, uh, also Vermont has a, um, uh, a pretty groundbreaking uh, uh, network of recovery centers uh, in in Brattleboro. There's a turning point of Wyndham County. They they have quite a number of uh, of uh, of you know uh, free open to the public uh, events uh, that are uh, alcohol uh, and drug free. They have times when the center is just simply open and people can come in, uh, play pool, have have a good sober time with others. If people are looking for a place to do that, uh, turning point. Uh, of Wyndham County, you can you can find uh, information uh, about them on, on the internet and, and around. Uh, well, I want to thank you so much, both of you, um, Kurt White, who's the clinical manager of Starting Now in the Birches program, and Dr. Jeffrey Kane, who's the chief of addictions uh, at uh, not the chief of addictions, but a, t a chief of <laughs> addiction what? services. Ad addiction <laughs> services. That's right. Um, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, I, I know that both of you are very busy and. It's a wonder that your beepers haven't gone off as we've been talking, except I made you turn them off. Um, and also, um, congratulations on starting now. 20 years is an amazing record, and uh, you all should be really proud of all the good you're doing out in the community. And thank you for joining us, and we look forward to coming back, the Brattleboro Retreat, and having more discussions like this on Keep Talking, a dialogue about mental health. Thanks. Mm -hmm.